Hi, everybody. Nice to virtually meet you. Um, so I'm going to kick it off here. There are three of us speaking today. I'm Kat Gilbert. I'm the Sales and Marketing Associate for Yellow Goat Design. Um, also speaking will be Monica Blair-Smith and Jennifer Abbott, who are both uh, design development. So uh, to start with a little bit about my background and who I am and uh, the design role that I serve at Yellow Goat. Um, I actually trained as a painter and a fine artist, and, but I was also interested in a lot of other things at school. So I ended up working at a literary magazine called The Oxford American, where I was um, the lead intern on the art and architecture issue. And while I was doing this, I got to contact a lot of architecture firms and art galleries, and I became really sort of interested in the story behind architecture and the spaces um, and sort of what they mean and what they mean to people. So from there, I moved on to uh, working actually at Martha Stewart in New York. Um, I worked in production and in books and magazines. And I eventually ended up finding work as a um, sales coordinator for a multi-line rep in the hospitality industry, which led to uh, becoming the sales and marketing uh, associate at Yellow Goat Design, um, which was a great fit for me, not only because of my artistic background, um, but because of my interest in architecture and design as well. So um, excellent fit for me, really found my place here, and I'm so happy to represent them in the really cool uh, products that they produce. So to start with, I'm going to show you a short brand video, um, sort of telling you what Yellow Goat's all about, um, what we do, how we do it, and then I'll get a little deeper into sort of my role here and um, the role of design marketing. The possibilities for fabricating something here at Yellow Goat are constrained only by someone's imagination. Yellow Goat Design is a design house. We can bring to life any vision that a client has. Clients are learning the value of design. The more you invest in creating these unique spaces, the more people are going to want to come and be there because they feel good in those spaces. You have enough confidence to put a Yellow Goat light fixture in your building. These people are going to feel confident being there and they're going to feel good underneath those fixtures that are telling a story. They are inspiring people in the space. We are honored to be part of projects with top design and architecture firms in the country. We have offices around the globe and therefore someone is working and designing for your logo design 24-7. Designers aren't actually allowed to start designing until they've worked on the factory floor for six months. So they can see the substrates, feel the materials, and know how to manipulate them and work with them to come up with their beautiful design. We absolutely value the use of high quality materials in every piece that we build. There's no automated process for cranking out hundreds of light fixtures. Everything is hand built by individuals, so the level of craftsmanship is very high. We make products that are completely unique. So we can build what you want, not what we've designed necessarily. And we collaborate with the designers, whether it's the architect, designer, the homeowner, to get to a product that they have envisioned, and then we will build that for them. No one does exactly what Yellow Goat Design does. We have the capabilities of designing from scratch and taking that process all the way through to completion and installation. So not only are we designing and coming up with these amazing concepts, we're then also engineering those and detail drawing them to make them buildable. And then our craftsmen actually build them in the factory. From there, we are shipping them on site and installing them. Everything is built to the UL standards using all UL components. We certify everything in the factory, so when it arrives on site, it is built and ready to hang. Yellow Goat is a company that you come to for something different, for something that no one else makes. And I certainly don't want to make the same thing that other people make, you know. Yellow Goat Design believes that the sky is the limit. And what we can do, our design capabilities, and the things that we can fabricate are limitless. We build 
dreams that people have. All right, so that just gives you a really good idea of a lot of the projects we've worked on, um, sort of what we do and how we do it. So um, as you saw, our main uh, sort of focus is lighting. Um, we also do screens. We have a category called dreams, um, and this is fully custom pieces that we've made for a client. And we also do kids play, but not in North and South America, um, which is where we're located. So we're not gonna focus so much on that, but if you are interested in kids play, go check it out on the website, cause it's really fun. Um, so a little bit about like who we are uh, and some of our main tenants and things we focus on as a company. We are original designers. We really like to push the boundaries of design. Um, you know, there's trends, but we don't always love to follow them because we have a really artistic background and we like to produce cool new things. Um, we are a full service design house, which means we have an in-house team of designers. Um, we fabricate all of our own work. So we have factories in Toronto and we also have a factory in Australia. So um, we design it, we fabricate it. And then if you need it, um, some clients choose us, some clients don't, we can also install the piece, which doesn't seem that important, but honestly, um, installation can be one of the most important parts of the whole project. Um, we have had pieces installed upside down before. So um, it's good to know that the people who install it also are the people who built it in the factory and they're really familiar with how it works. Um, so the story of Yellow Goat Design, this is Jersey Lesko. Um, he is a artist in Australia. He um, was looking for lighting for his home, couldn't find something he liked, and as artists sometimes do, decided to design his own lighting. Uh, so he started that and eventually it really grew into a big developed business. He trained lots of other designers, um, sort of in the same style that he has. And now we have a wonderful, very robust company. Um, on the left hand side here, you'll see this painting, which is actually of a yellow goat. And it was one of Jersey's first paintings. And that is where the name yellow goat design comes from. Um, so now we obviously have a very big company, uh, lots of folks on board. Um, Carrie Schuster is the president and CEO of the US branch. She actually was an interior designer in Australia, met Jersey, um, loved what he did and wanted to be a part of it. So now she runs the US branch. Um, we have a wonderful design team in Australia. We obviously have amazing people that fabricate these um, pieces at each location and all of us terrific folks that do all the behind the scenes design development, marketing, et cetera. So what I'm going to focus on today um, might not be super enlightening, but it's sort of interesting to think about in terms of a design company where the focus is always usually on creating the pieces. Um, my focus would be on sort of showcasing these pieces and bringing them to the world and introducing the world to them. So I'm gonna focus a little bit on how to sort of develop your design brand. So we're gonna look at three elements, philosophy, story, and content. And to start with um, is philosophy, which I think everyone is familiar with these days. Who am I? what do I stand for? Why do I stand for it? So as we all know, in the world of social media, content cannot live in a void. Um, there needs to be a history behind it. There needs to be reason. There needs to be authenticity. So these are some of the main questions I would think about when thinking about uh, what your brand stands for. What's the history behind it? Um, what, do the, what does the name of your brand mean? And how does it sound to consumers? Um, which is a really, <clears throat> excuse me, interesting thing to think about if you've uh if you're thinking about product names or a brand name the uh sound linguistically can be a really um important element to selling your products especially um if you've never heard of the um kiki booba effect please google that it's a really interesting thing um and kind of a a neat thing to look at if you're thinking about product naming or design development um what does my brand make and how is it different from others? So one of the things that's really great to do for this is sort of make a list, um, particularly in product design. What are you making? 
Why is it different from what everyone else is making? And those little key elements will help you sort of pull a story out of there and um, develop your brand as well. And then, you know, it's pretty obvious, but if you could sum up your brand in one phrase, what would it be? Maybe write 20 phrases and see which one fits your brand best. So these are just like sort of some exercises to help you figure out that main philosophy. Uh, story. Obviously, again, you can't live in a void these days. Um, so you need to have a story behind both your brand and behind your products and your project and who's making them and who's a part of that whole process. So things to really think about here. Who am I working with? Who's my team? Who are my clients? And how can I amplify their voices as well? So you can put products on your social media, you know, interiors all day long. But if you're not including um, the people that have helped you create them and um, showcasing sort of the behind the scenes, I think a lot of really cool content can get lost that way. Um, the history of the project and how does the work fit into that narrative? A lot of times as designers, um, particularly product designers, you will be brought a story that the um, client is trying to tell and you sort of have to visually, <clears throat> excuse me, interpret that story. So you do have to think about the history and the narratives and how this visual interpretation is reaching that goal. So that's a kind of a really cool, fun thing that you get to do. Um, what's your audience uh, that you're speaking to? Um, what community are you affecting or speaking to? The location of your project can matter. So these are all elements that can sort of affect your design story and um, be different elements that you can call out. And then finally, think about what design tools you're using. Are you using video? Are you capturing design development? Are you just taking photos? <clears throat> There's so many ways to um, sort of capture that story. So make sure you're, you're utilizing all of them. And on that note, content. Um, so I would say a good 80 to 90% of my job sometimes is just collecting assets and content from projects. And that's an especially um, interesting thing for us because all of us at Yellow Goat Design work remotely. And we also have projects all over the US and all over the world. So I'm reaching out to a lot of people every day asking, do you have photos? Do you have things you can share about this project? Um, I really am, you know, a story collector and I use those elements to tell um, the story of our designs online as well. So some of the ways we do that are videos celebrating both our team and the collaborative team. So we do design spotlights. We also have some great project profiles, which um, we'll show you one of those a little bit later. Social media needs to be both the products and the projects, um, not just static images of products. You know, you need to include everybody. And uh, we tend to do a lot of, you know, graphic design. We do lookbooks for each collection. This one is um, from our recent Wicker collection and it sort of just showcases all the products in a really beautiful way. And you can download those online. And then design development. You wouldn't think that design development, sort of the components of putting together the project are that important, but they are. They really showcase all the work that you've put into these designs. And they also capture your original ideas, which is super important and is why organizations like the original exist to um, showcase and sort of claim your work, which um, as we see a lot these days, a lot of artists are, you know, going online saying designs have been stolen, you know, and so you want to be really careful and guard your work and capture design development in your story and your history, um, because it's all a really important part of your brand. So on that note, that's going to be it for me. Um, I am going to pass this on to Monica, our design associate, and she is going to talk about design development and sort of the nitty gritty of how a piece gets created at Yellow Goat Design. So Monica, take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Monica, and I'm a design associate here at Yellow Goat Design. I am based in our Philadelphia office. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit about myself before I dive into discussing the design development process. So I have a background in interior design as well. I went to the University of Cincinnati and studied interior design. At the University of Cincinnati, you have a really great opportunity to do six internships prior to graduation. So I was able to look into different avenues of design and explore different firms before graduating. 
Um, after graduation, I started my career at Walt Disney Imagineering with a year of professional internship there. I worked for the public parks and resort design team there in the Orlando office. Um, and then at the Walt Disney Imagineering, I had a great opportunity to develop a lot of custom designs. And that's where I really found my passion in that area. So I worked on a lot of projects that included textiles and carpets, um, doing custom FF&E, and I really found that this was my niche. I also discovered Yellow Goat Design while I was at Walt Disney Imagineering, so I always had an eye on them throughout my experience as an interior designer. After Walt Disney, I went to Stantec and I worked for a Visioning Brands and Experiences team where we focus on experiential design for mixed use development and brand repositioning. So with this team, I also was able to do a lot of custom FF&E. And um, my favorite project was a project called Shanghai Village, which was a shopping center that was very inspired by Art Deco. And I did a lot of the architectural embellishments for the facades of the shopping center. Um, and so I just found that this is really the area that I wanted to exclusively focus on. And when Yellow Goat Design had an opportunity to work with them, I jumped on that. And here I am. So I've been with Yellow Goat for two years now, and um, I really enjoy it. My position has changed quite a bit because I went from being a designer to now assisting with the design process and being more of a collaborator on the manufacturing side. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start talking about that process and taking a design from the initial concept through to installation. So the design development process starts with a concept and an idea that you bring to a manufacturer and collaborator to develop. You go through the design development process and once that design is ready for production, we move into that stage and then finally installation. So I know um, this process is something that many of you are already going through every day in your um, experience at school, but I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how this is focused on the um, feature aspect of a project and how it works with collaborating with a manufacturer. Can we switch to the next slide? So in this conversation, I am going to specifically talk about a project called the American Kennel Club. Um, this project was, uh, we worked on this with Gensler, New York, and this is the American Kennel Club that is a museum located in Manhattan. Um, we, I chose this project because it's a very custom design. It was really fun to work on. Um, we do a lot of designs that are completely from scratch. So um, this one is a really cool one to focus on because it's just really out there. So Gensler came to us and had an idea to do a really big feature piece for the American Kennel Club. And the very first part of developing something is setting up a kickoff call or meeting to discuss the design intent and understand the project parameters. So this slide shows what I received from Gensler and what we really started talking about. These are images that Gensler provided to convey their design intent and what was important to them for this project. So this project, um, some of the main key things that Gensler wanted to focus on was having a very big feature piece that was very visible throughout the day and night to the heavy pedestrian and um, heavily traffic streetscape as well. They wanted to really bring attention to this museum. So the idea was to develop a custom dog of some kind that was in a really key area of the space that could be seen from many different vantage points. They shared with us this rendering on the left hand side that shows the dog visible at night and they shared with us the zoning on the right hand side talking about how people will experience the space and the flow through the space and also when they're going to experience this wow factor and how they want people to experience it. So they helped us define this project and helped us understand what they're looking for. And that's really helpful when you're working with a designer and a collaborator. A collaborator. The more information that you can share with a team like Yellow Goat, the better we can collaborate with you. Um, we'd love to work with you at the capacity of a partner. And many manufacturers are capable of doing that because they have designers on board that are happy to assist and really take this to the next level. So throughout this kickoff call, we also identified the design concept, which is the dog, and also how we're going to approach it. So we talked a lot about materiality. Um, would this dog be wireframe? Would it be 3D printed? Um, would it be made out of wood dowels or LED rope? Um, we also talked about the parameters. I know that they mentioned that they really wanted this to be visible between, 
all day and all night. So we discussed how we were going to achieve that. Um, we looked at a lot of different options for that. Also, what breed the dog would be, what stance the dog might have, um, what scale the dog would be as well. We talked about how it would be lit and many different options with that throughout the kickoff call so we could understand what's valuable to them. And that way we could take it from there and start developing iterations to help assist them convey their design to the client to eventually get to approval. So after the call, we really understood their values and requirements. We understood that this fixture needed to be a statement mint piece and needed to be illuminated, a large scale dog, and it needs to stand out on the busy streets of Manhattan and be timeless for years to come. So that's where we started. And then we moved into design development. So this is just a quick diagram of what the design development process looks like. We started with the kickoff call and developing the concept. We also established a budget with them, which was around 60,000. So all of our iterations were going to be within that. It's always helpful to share your budget along with your project parameters with the collaborator. That way they can really understand what's feasible for the client. As designers, as we all know, we can design something that is amazing, but could be completely out of reach. So it's always good to stay within the parameters. During this process, we went through a number of models and designs proposals to Gensler. They provided feedback on our model models that we shared with them. And then we just continued to refine the design until we got to a good place. We also provided samples that they, way they could look at these materials with light and how this fixture would really come to life. Once the fixture was approved, we went into shop drawings. And shop drawings are so important because they are provided to show every detail of the design that is signed off on before we move into fabrication. And then fabrication and installation. So here's the final outcome. We finally landed on a mid-size mixed dog that was powder coat and a white metal. We did a wireframe dog that could be illuminated by an RGB light system around it, so it could change experience throughout the day and night. Um, this fixture was about nine feet tall and about nine feet wide, so it's a very substantial design. And it also came in one piece because we confirmed that it would be able to be um, accessed into the building at that size and they were literally able just to connect it to the ceiling. So um, this was a really great experience and we're gonna show you a video that talks a little bit more about this process on the next slide. I'm Amanda Zaychik and I'm a design manager at Gensler. I'm here at the American Kennel Club Museum of the Dog and we are with this dog sculpture that was fabricated by Yellow Goat Design. The American Kennel Club decided to move their collection back to New York, where we are now. It's one of the finest collections of uh, dog paintings, um, sculpture, ceramics, and other uh, dog-related items. So it's a place that you can learn a lot about dogs. So basically, we, uh, we ended up with this great double-height space in a really excellent location. We've got foot traffic from Grand Central. This spot was really like a prime opportunity to do something cool that could become kind of a, a beacon, so it was recognizable, and it would attract the attention of people walking by. They've asked us to create this beautiful, tall, sitting dog that's going to be suspended from their ceiling. We came up with this idea for kind of a, a wireframe dog, so it did have that openness and the transparency. So this was a challenging one for the designers that did all of the design work in 3D, and then we have to somehow roll and manipulate this drawing and come up with how to bend all of this quarter-inch stainless steel rod, weld it together, and make it look like a dog. Yellow Goat was a great partner in the design. There was a lot of back and forth in the beginning. Yellow Goat actually supplied us with a model that we put into a HoloLens so we could view it on site and see what it looked like. And it was just a really collaborative process. It shipped in one piece amazingly. They brought it here and um, hung it. It was actually pretty quick. And it's so much fun to just see people kind of stop and, you know, they'll do a double take and they'll stop and look. It's really exciting. I'm so glad I got to share with you this really amazing project that we worked on with Gensler New York. Now I'm going to transition to Jen, who's going to talk about transitioning from a traditional interior design position to being a design associate with Yellow Go, exclusively focusing on custom feature fixtures. Go ahead, Jen. 
Thanks, Monica. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Jen. I'm a design associate at Yellow Goat, and I've been with the team uh, since January. I am based in Boston. Um, I, uh, I'll give you a little background on me. I grew up in New York City and um, you know, was surrounded by a lot of great design inspiration from a very young age. Um, you know, There's so many amazing and interesting spaces in the city that it's really impossible not to be inspired by them. Uh, my undergraduate degree was in communications, so although I was always, you know, interested in and passionate about uh, design from, you know, pretty much my whole life, I, I didn't pursue it as a real career path until post-college. I finished my master's in interior design at the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. in 2013. Um, during my time in graduate school, I was able to study abroad in Milan and intern at a design firm in London, um, both of which were, you know, important and fulfilling experiences. I worked for an architecture firm local to DC for five years, uh, which is where I really got my feet wet um, with regard to, uh, you know, working in the design industry. Um, this is where I learned, you know, kind of the basics of the design process. Um, in the real world, uh, so to speak. I worked primarily in, um, in workplace design, but also some hospitality, restaurant, uh, retail, and multi-residential projects as well. I eventually moved to Boston um, and worked for global design build firm Unispace for two years. Uh, because we did design and construction under one roof, I learned a lot about the other side of the project. Um, you know, the estimating and budgeting and um, construction side of things. Um, this was really valuable experience and I gained a much better understanding of the process as a whole, um, you know, working in design build. Um, eventually I was ready to make a change and I'll discuss some of my reasons why in a bit. Um, I had been aware of Yellow Goat for years because I went to school with our, uh, our design director and I had always really admired their work and the uniqueness of their designs. Um, the timing worked out that they were looking for someone with experience working in design firms, you know, right around the time I was looking to make a bit of a switch. So um, now here I am. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, making the transition from project designer to the product design development and sales side that I do now. So, you know, some of the major differences um, between these two roles, uh, one of them is kind of being in the weeds versus a more high level involvement. So what I mean by that is, you know, when you're a project designer, you're involved in every single detail of several projects at once. Um, you know, how many projects varies by firm and based on size and complexity of the project. I worked on, I would say on average, um, between five and 10 projects at once um, during my time at design firms. Um, now I'm involved in, you know, one or a few aspects of many projects at a time. I don't even know how many there's, there's a lot. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's the difference between the deep involvement and high level involvement in a project. That's one major difference. Um, another one is working at an office versus working remotely. Um, when you're a project designer, you know, you're typically in an office every day, although this may change post COVID, we'll, we'll see. Um, design firms tend to, you know, want your butt in your seat, so to speak. Um, there's a lot of in-person collaboration required in a traditional designer role. Um, you know, also obviously you need to be in an office to use the materials library and to touch and feel things. You know, we designers obviously always need to do that. So, um, you know, even before, as, as we've already kind of discussed a little bit, even before COVID, most of the Yellow Goat team worked remotely. Um, since, you know, we're all in different locations. I'm in Boston, Monica's in Philadelphia, Kat was in New York until recently and is now, you know, closer to the Chicago area. Um, our design director, Nicola, is in San Francisco. So, you know, it's the difference of kind of a more structured and traditional work environment versus being on your own, you know, at least on your own in the physical sense. Um, you know, of course, there's travel involved in my current role too. Um, and if that ever resumes, I will get to visit design firms across the country again, uh, which is great. Um, another major difference is kind of approaching the design from the other side. So, you know, all of a sudden, the designer who I used to be is my client. 
um, designers always appreciate, you know, when I tell them I have been in their shoes and I understand their deliverables and deadlines. Um, you know, everyone at Yellow Goat has a design background in some sense, and it puts designers at ease knowing that we have, you know, sat in their seat, so to speak. Um, another major difference is the, you know, kind of highly structured work environment versus being more of a self starter. Um, at a design firm, there are times when you can definitely feel like you're being micromanaged a bit. Um, at Yellow Goat, you know, no one's checking up on me throughout the day um, because we're all equally busy. And, you know, our whole team has confidence in each other that we'll all get our work done. Um, you know, of course, we're always there for each other as a team when issues and questions come up and we have plenty of discussions. Um, but, you know, I never feel like I'm being micromanaged. Um, of course, it helps that we're a group of, you know, highly self-motivated people. I think that that is really the only way it can work, so. Great, thank you, Jen. I think, Monica, we can bring you back on, perfect. Great, so we're gonna jump into Q&A. Students, just a reminder, you can submit your questions. You can find that function either at the bottom or top of your screen, depending on the device that you're using. Can you guys remind me where you're tuning in today from? I think we're on mute. From Philadelphia. Yeah, um, Boston. I am actually coming from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Great, yeah, so all over the place. And your team usually works remotely, you know, even before this whole global pandemic. And I know students now, many of them are finding themselves having to navigate remote situations with what's going on. What advice do you have for them? Um, I would recommend putting a schedule together and just trying to make a routine out of what you're doing every day. I think that's really helpful. I usually try to divide my day into morning, the early afternoon, and then mid-afternoon. Um, that way I can just feel that I've accomplished what I typically plan to accomplish at that point every day. Great. How does working remotely affect your daily life as a designer in such as you know, collaborations with clients, with other employees, um, as far as finding materials, working with people in different time zones. Can you walk us through that? Sure, Jen, Jen or Monica, do you wanna talk about that or I'm happy to? Yeah, sure. Um, in terms of materials, so our factory is located in Cambridge, Ontario. Um, they're very accessible and we talk through materials all the time and send samples, custom samples to clients, directly to clients. Right now with COVID, we're sending them to a number of the team members, that way everyone can have a hand on these samples. Um, in terms of collaboration, it really, you just get used to knowing what time it is in every time zone. Um, we work with between Pacific time and Australia, so um, you know, typically in the evenings, I'll, I'll have a call to Australia to just touch base and have a couple design calls to make sure that we're on the same page and continuing per, per um, the designer's intent. And that's just how it works. It just kind of also helps us with like our routine and planning our day. I always know that like in the evening, I'm going to give a call to Australia and check in. And in the mornings, we usually check in with Canada to talk about the materials and that kind of thing. Yeah, it sounds like communication is really very important. Yeah, yeah I would say from my perspective, um, a lot of it is sort of, um, again, collecting and being sort of a librarian and having our design team be advocates of their own work. So that means asking them to do really nice little videos for me um, if they're in Australia or taking some great photos. And so, um, so in that sense, I think our whole team sort of has to do design from like a graphic and story collecting standpoint sometimes. And um, that can be challenging, but it's also really fun because I think everybody takes a lot of pride in their work as well. That's great. I think this one is for Jen and Monica. What was your time working in your previous roles like before you began designing at Yellow Goat? I mean, I, I think I, I, I touched on mine a bit, but um, you know, I, I worked on a variety of, of projects. Um, primarily, I worked in workplace design, um, but I did some other types of projects as well. 
um, I, I in the first year of my of my experience at my firm in DC was um, an internship while I was doing my thesis in school. So I started, you know, with that, and then I was hired full time, um, you know, to be a to be a designer. And um, as I as I mentioned, I you know I I did get to see a lot of projects from start to finish, which was which was very cool. Um, I worked with a lot of really great people and of course ran into, you know, some, some difficult personalities as well, like we all have. <laughs> um, and, but overall, like I, you know, I've, I, I wouldn't trade that time for, for anything. Um, I think it was so valuable. So, you know, that's kind of just my experience. I agree. I think I loved working as a designer. I think that there's a lot of pros and cons with both sides. Um, I really enjoyed designing, but at this point being more focused on a specific focal point of the project is nice. I enjoy doing kind of like the fun parts of the design, if you will. Um, and so I, I get a lot out of that as well. And I do think being outside of the traditional design firm, I have found myself having more of an opportunity to be creative. Um, that's not specifically related to your to your career. So that's nice as well. Great. How long does it take a project from start to finish? Can you walk us through that process a little bit? Sure. It's really all over the place. Um, some projects you can get right to the final design in a week and some take about what would you say Janet like six months to get to uh, approved design? Yeah I think so much of it depends on the timeline of the uh, project and, and at what point we're involved because you know sometimes um, we, we love it when we're involved early and a designer comes to us and says I'm just starting schematic design or design development and we say great you know what's the project completion date it's one of the first questions we ask um, you know, we do our standard fabrication lead time is um, 12 weeks after receipt of approved shops. Um, so, you know, there's nothing sitting on a shelf as we've kind of already talked about, even if it's specified per website. So I think, um, yeah, like Monica said, it's, you know, it really depends on the project. If we're involved early, it, it, um, it you know, depends on when they need it on site. And then sometimes someone will say, I need this, you know, in, in two months and it moves quicker. So it really right. just depends. And how many projects at any given time are you working on? I counted, um, I guess, before Jen started in January, and I had, I think, like 150 projects or something. Um, wow. Jen, I don't know how many you have right now, probably yeah. about the same. Pro yeah, yeah, maybe not quite as many yet, but I would say probably at least 100. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot. Yeah. I'm sure it can be a little challenging uh, staying on top of that many projects. How do you kind of feel that? you have to be organized and just um, we have a system for tracking the projects. So just reminders to check in after we sent samples and that kind of thing. Um, but it is actually interesting. I think I remember almost all the projects that I've been involved in. Um, they are so unique. It's hard not to get excited about it and um, be wondering in a week's time if they had a chance to review your model and check in anyway. So yeah. It's, it's a lot more natural than it seems with that many. Right. What's the most challenging, but also the most rewarding part of working with clients? Um, I would say the most challenging is just if it's, especially if it's someone you haven't worked with before this for me, um, learning, everyone has their own work style and just learning, you know, to kind of, you want to obviously check all of the boxes that they're asking you to check and, and give them what they need. And, um, but everyone is different and everyone communicates differently. And, you know, sometimes it's easy to get information out. You know, we need certain information obviously to put proposals together and things like that. Sometimes it's really easy and people provide it right away and it, that's great. And then other times you kind of have to track stuff down. So I think that's, um, that can be challenging just learning, especially with this many projects at a time, just, kind of having to remember how each, uh, how each client likes to work. Um, and then, you know, obviously it's really rewarding um, when, 
you know, they love it in the end and they come back to us for the next project, hopefully. And, and you know, having this kind of relationship that we develop and, and having repeat clients and stuff is great. That's just my experience. Right. Does Yellow Goat ever do pieces with motion, like kinetic sculptures? We haven't done a kinetic sculpture to date. Um, we have discussed it with projects, but um, the budget is has been cost prohibitive so far, so we haven't been able to explore it further. But we wouldn't take it off the table. What's the most challenging part about switching from design school to working at a design firm? I would say for me, like number one is budgets. <laughs> um, I feel like in, at least for me in school, and maybe it was just the program I was in, but it was, it was very much more about the theory of design and, and sky's the limit and just let your mind go, which is great. I feel like that's so important to develop that, um, you know, that skill. Um, but, you know, in the real world, it's like, oh wait, I, I wanna specify all this cool stuff, but the budget's like this, you know what I mean? Not, not that every budget is tiny, but um, I feel like that was the biggest change for me. What about you, Monica? I would definitely agree that budgets is the biggest um, challenge and I guess the hardest thing to be comfortable with, because of course you'd like to design to the highest limit you could possibly. Um, and then I also would just say that in school, you have an opportunity to kind of just, your, your creative exploration, you are your client many times in that development. And um, when you're in a firm, you know, your aesthetic might not match the client's aesthetic and just having to really um, learn to be a fluid designer with like really what the client's intent is is what your intent is I think that's something that every designer that has a passion for design will run into um, kind of sharing that concept right what advice do you have for students who are looking to get an internship in the field um, I've applied for a ton of internships because I've done so many of them I think just get out there um, you know there's so many internships that are available and a lot of times I actually just had a mentorship call earlier today and a lot of firms are very interested in providing them so um, just be eager and willing and also when you get one um, be prepared for anything you might be sorting a materials library for three months but if you do it well and you do everything you can to be to be the best you can be, they'll remember that and they will um, definitely give you opportunity. Yeah, and I was gonna say another another piece, I totally agree with everything Monica said, and I think another piece of advice I would give once things start to return to normal would be try to go to um, industry events too. I think that's a great place to meet people and I always feel like it's, you know, it's easier to make a, like a connection in person and, um, so I think, you know, there's a lot of industry events that are open to students um, and just getting out there, like Monica said, and just meeting people in the industry and stuff. Absolutely. So sadly, we're running out of time for today. I don't think we're gonna be able to get to everyone's questions. Students, I do wanna let you know that we'll be following up with your questions after this talk. Uh, but final question for you guys, and I'd love to hear from each of you, any last words or piece of advice to give the students tuning in today? Um, I would say um, maybe just, you know, don't assume that your design path is going to be uh, straight and narrow. I think all of us sort of came here from very branching paths. I, as a painter, never thought I would be in design and, um, and it actually was a great fit for me. So just be open to opportunities and whatever comes along. I agree with that as well. I also would like to say to give it a shot. I know that looking for a career or an internship, you may um, be waiting to find the perfect one. But from my experience, I've gotten so much insight that's helped me develop my career from each of the opportunities I've had. Um, even if it wasn't the right fit, I'm so glad that I worked everywhere I have. Yeah, I, I totally agree with 
what you guys both said and um, to kind of piggyback off of what Monica was saying about even if it's not something that you think is exactly what you want to do. I mean, when I was in school, I thought I would never want to work in workplace design. I was like, I only want to do hospitality. I only want to do restaurants and hotels. And then I started interning at a workplace design firm and I actually ended up really loving it. Um, it's such an interesting time, especially now. I mean, how the workplace is going to change, um, you know. Uh, you know, I just thought it was such an interesting time to be in workplace. So I like I never thought I would I would go into that route, but I ended up absolutely loving it. So yeah, I, I think that and um, you know also I, people always say, oh, that must be such a fun job, and it is a fun job to be a designer. But obviously, as you all know from school, it's it's also hard work. So definitely be prepared for for some hard work, but it's very fulfilling. So absolutely. Well, Jen, Monica, Kat, I want to say a huge thank you for coming on today. This has been so insightful and such great advice. If you want to learn more about Yellow Goat Design, you can visit their website, yellowgoatdesign.com, or their Instagram channel at Yellow Goat Design. If you want to learn more about the Original Americas, you can visit theoriginalamericas.com or our Instagram, the Original USA. Definitely check out the website. Thanks, guys. We'll see you on the next one.